All right. If there is one thing I love, it is interviewing seasoned veterans in the health field. And that is our guest today. His name is Michael Biamonte, and he's the founder of the Biamonte Center for Clinical Nutrition. He is a co-creator of BioCybernetics. It's a computer software program that studies blood work, mineral tests, and other labs to determine exactly where your body is in balance. Um, he started creating this in the 80s for NASA, by the way, for aerospace. Really cool story. I'll let him tell you that story. Um, and he has, like I said, been practicing as a naturopath for 30, over 30 years. So, so much wisdom, so much knowledge. It was ridiculous. I was picking his brain like crazy. Of course we hit on candida because that is one of his areas of expertise. He has a book and you can get it on Amazon. It's called the candida chronicles guys. He shares the estimate statistic is 30% of Americans is what they think have candida. It's a huge problem. <laughs> I'll hear like a lot of naturopaths and things say like, yeah, cause everyone has candida. Okay. Not everyone, but it is, it's big. So listen to that part of the episode to know what candida symptoms look like, because as he describes it, it's like, it can be a very slow moving thing and it's easy to miss. So find out about that. Find out about so many, we talk about organic acid tests, what that means. Um, you know, which tests you want to do for certain things. So full of knowledge. We'll go ahead and dive in. Here is Michael Biamonte. I know that in your, in your bio, it says that you started to do this for, um, aerospace. Is that yeah, correct? It's, it was for NASA. Wow. Um, so many years ago, back in the eighties, I was in naturopathic school. And when I, when I was in school, my specialty was the interpretation of blood work. And I had a lot of people who were influencing me at the time. There was a doctor named Jim uh, Messina and there was Ken Brockman. Ken Brockman is a, was a barnstorming chiropractor who was interpreting blood tests in a fashion that was way beyond what an average medical doctor would even think of. Oh. Brockman could look at somebody's blood tests and tell you what was happening with your hypothalamus gland and your vitamin B1 and all these different things. So I studied intensely all this stuff. And when I got out of school, I had this idea, why can't we put this on a computer? Because computers were just coming out really back in the 80s. Yeah. So I was looking for a programmer who could take all the knowledge I had, all the, because they were basically, I was thinking in terms of algorithms. So it was like calcium in your blood is above this level, phosphorus is below that level, your globulin is in this range, that means you need vitamin this and that, or that means check right. your 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 physiology for this and that, right? Yeah. So instead of finding the programmer, I wandered into a health food store in Massapequa, Long Island, gave them my card, explained what I was doing. And the woman says, you need to speak to Dr. Santoro because he's already got this. He's already doing this. Mm -hmm. She gave me this Dr. Santoro's number. I called him on the phone, told him what my thing was. So he invited me down to um, some, uh, um, a computer place out in Old Bethpage, Long Island. And he had this computer system there and he had all these real nerds, these aerospace physiology guys there. And I told them my background and they just loved it. And they showed me what they were doing. So it turned out Dr. Santoro was the man who developed the life support systems on the lunar module. And he also was a naturopathic doctor. So he had the same idea that I had. He wanted to put all this data on a computer, but he had a son who was a PhD in computer programming. So his son was able to take all this raw material and organize it in a fashion where it actually became a model of the human body on computer. And they were using a language that was called Fortran, which is table driven. A table driven language means that you can take one little function out and move it someplace without having to rewrite the entire program, which was the ideal thing if you were going to try to create this facsimile of the human body because in actual fact what we had is when you told the computer to run this person's lab work we gave the computer all the blood work on joe blow right you tell the computer to run the work and the computer simulated what this guy's body was doing based on his lab work and then it looked to see where he was going awry what nutrients he needed what vitamins he had if there was any um particular toxicity that we should look further for. Yeah. So the computer like did a screening of the guy's body to tell us what other tests we did, but it also laid out all the nutrients that he needed based on the blood work. Mm. So we, we, um, we were assembling this program for about maybe four or five years. 
and it, it, I have to admit, it, 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 we were getting a little bit expensive because we were having, mm -hmm. we were flying doctors in from all over the world to help us add to the data. And we were charging it to, to Grumman, who then built NASA for it. So eventually they said, you know, this is getting kind of expensive, guys. You need to sort of chill out. <laughs> and the next, the next thing we knew, the project was cut. Now, they originally wanted this for the space station, for the astronauts in deep expended, um, extended space. This is what they wanted. But um, I don't know. They must have found some other way to do it cheaper. Mm. But we said to them, well, what do we do with this now? We've got 10 years of yeah. uh, material. And they said, we don't care. Keep it. Do whatever you want with it. <laughs> so we took the data. We went home and we started a corporation called BioCybernetics. Now, biocybernetics means the definition of bio means biological. Cybernetics is the study of self-regulating mechanisms, which is mm. what the human body is. Very cool. So we, we started to farm this service out to different doctors mm. to use, and they would send us the patient's tests. We would put it in the computer, and then the computer would give them a report of what kind of diet the guy needs, what vitamins he needs, what other things you should suspect test for, et cetera. Right. And to, to this day, we, as far as I know, we have the only in the world the only working model of the human body on computer i don't know anyone else who has this are you you're accounting for um is it all based off blood no actually the, there's two primary tests hair analysis and a blood and blood work mm -hmm. those are the mm -hmm. two primary things that it looks at but it can look at any test. It can look at the like an organic acid test from Great Plains Lab. Mm, it nice. can even it can even look at your chiropractic adjustments. We can tell the computer really? what, yeah, what things you normally get it need to be adjusted, like what vertebrae are normally out, and it's wow. think with that too. Wow, very cool. Okay. Acupuncture so, points it looks at. This is like so up my alley. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, we'll have to talk offline, too, because I'm looking for a way to be able to help more people with this. How do people do this? Is it through their doctor? Can you go, you know what I mean? Do you have to have a doctor or practitioner give you access to your guys' software? How do you guys distribute your software? Is this no, available people, to the public? Yeah, yeah. People can just, they can just have their doctor do the tests, have uh -huh. the tests sent to us, and then it goes to the cool. computer, and then we send them back a report. Very cool. Okay, so um, in terms of things that you're looking for, you know, I, I, just for people who are listening, what are some of the things that you've noticed? Cause I also like, you know, I, I definitely go down the naturopathic route, holistic health route. And obviously the way that we're reading blood labs in holistic health and naturopathic health is not what you're going to be getting at your doctor's office. I'm honestly like, I don't mean to bad mouth anyone, but when I see that, you know, someone's insulin resistant, for example, and their doctor doesn't even check their vitamin D, for example, you know, I'm like, wow, this is like, criminal <laughs> like what's going on like how can they not check that or tell someone that or you know and so like what are some of you know kind of just going into the nitty-gritty of these labs like what are some of the common things that you have seen in all of these years of this work that people have common issues in blood work that people aren't being helped with you know i'm sure vitamin d might be one of them but what are some other big if i mean you tell me but what are some of the big hitters that people might not even be aware that are off in their bodies that are creating a huge impact in terms of their health well if most if anyone in your audience knows who i am if they're familiar with me or any any of the uh, books i've written you know that my primary specialty is candida yeah and it was through it was through this system that i discovered candida yes, and i, I definitely want to ask the you traits about that. Are, what the traits <laughs> are in people um, and when you look at somebody's white blood cell count, if their neutrophils are low and their lymphocytes are high, that's the first giveaway that they have candida. Mm. Okay. That's a tip off because that indicates that there's some type of dysbiosis going on in their intestinal tract, particularly their colon. Mm. So can candida and parasites. Now, with, with this system, very often elevated monocytes or elevated eosinophils will be an indication of parasites, but also elevated uric acid or a very low uric acid can indicate that the mm. person has parasites. Mm. More protozoa in, that, in those cases. That's such good information to know. How, like, how common do you think? Well, Candida, I mean, you probably have the 30%. It's 30% of the U.S. population at wow. any given time has candida and that's increased since COVID because COVID also causes candida in people. And so does the COVID vaccines. They also cause people to develop candida. So because of that, it's probably higher. Okay. Let's, let's dive into candida. Cause I know you're an expert on this. So what are some, um, you know, some biofeedback, some signs of candida that people might consider 
just to tip them off of maybe, maybe I have candida. Well, usually the first thing that happens when they develop candida is their energy drops. And that's because their immune system, their adrenals, their thyroid, their liver is all being taxed by the mycotoxins and the alcohols that the candida releases. So first thing they'll notice is an energy drop. Then they'll start to notice that they're not quite mentally sharp. Their cognitive ability drops. And that's from the alcohols and the mycotoxins and neurological toxins that candida releases. Then they start noticing digestive problems, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, but more so constipation. Allergies then start to happen or food sensitivities could start to happen. Contact dermatitis, things like that, that normally they wouldn't have all of a sudden starts to creep in the picture. The problem with candida is everything happens so slowly and gradually that most people don't get it. You know, they just think, well, this is just happening for whatever reason, but that's how it's tricky. Then they'll notice food reactions and they're going to notice this is the crazy thing. They're going to notice they don't have the food reactions consistently. One day they're going to eat this food. It's going to bother them. The next day they eat it, it doesn't. And that's because of the the changes in the rhythms of their digestive system, their immune system, their toxic control system, and the weather also. Because the weather affects people with candida differently. Your environment does. If if a person with candida goes into a moldy house, like the sick building syndrome kind of thing, Mm -hmm. he's the one who reacts the most. Mm -hmm. When you talk to people who do mold remediation, They'll always tell you that they go to the house, they interview the people, they talk to them, and there's always one or two people who are the most severely affected. And some of the other people in the house are not affected as bad or at all. And it always turns out that the person in a mold remediation case who has the the, the strongest reactions, who's in the worst shape from living in this house with mold is the one who has candida. Mm. In your professional opinion, what are the root causes of candida? Well, traditionally, we know that the root causes of can- candida is iatrogenic. We know that it's mostly antibiotics that cause candida. And it was, that's even written in the Merck Manual, which is a, a book that every doctor has in his office that's held in great esteem. It's, we'll say in the Merck Manual that candida is caused by the indiscriminate use of broad spectrum antibiotics. But we also know that steroid and different hormones will do it. Estrogens can do it. Corticosteroids can do it. Because a corticoid steroid, if you understand the physiology, what it does is basically raises your blood sugar. It raises the, the, the glucose levels in your tiny capillaries where the candida is digging into. Because candida is basically a plant, you see. It's literally like having this broccoli growing in your intestinal tract. It grows roots. And those roots permeate your blood vessels to look for sugar because that's what feeds it. And that's how you develop leaky gut. When you get really bad candida, all those roots bust through your intestinal lining and now you have leaky gut syndrome. But it's primarily drugs and medications um, that cause it. Even like alcohol abuse can cause it. Stress can cause it. If someone gets into an accident, the trauma of the accident, it's not just that they go to the hospital and they're pumped with antibiotics, just the trauma of the accident, the trauma of getting oral surgery because it's the alimentary canal. All those things can cause candida. How about emotional trauma and just, you know, chronic stress from unresolved trauma? Chronic stress raises cortisol. So when we look at it, you know, if we want to, if we want to take the mystery off things, when you have chronic stress, there's a physiological response per Hans Selye. So the physiological response is going to be your cortisol is going to elevate. And when your cortisol elevates, it depresses your immune system. That's why for um, drugs, uh, I'm sorry, illnesses like leukemia, where your white blood count is sky high, they give you corticoid steroids to lower it. It's because there's that seesaw effect with these with these things. So chronic stress is definitely going to do it. And the other thing that's fascinating is that uh, candida interferes with your neurotransmitters. So once you develop candida, immediately your serotonin and all your neurotransmitters go off because your intestinal tract is used by your body as like a holding tank for neurotransmitters and hormones, and it shuttles them back and forth as needed. Even glutathione is is a lot of glutathione stored in your intestines and the body shuttles it back and forth. Hmm. So if your intestinal floor is off, that means your ability to absorb is off. It just doesn't mean you don't absorb nutrients and vitamins. You don't absorb whatever's in your gut, whether it's good or bad. Wow. And if your glutathione's off, like you're going to become more and more inflamed, more and more depressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, 
Um, obviously we'll link up your books in the show notes, but you know, path to healing, do you believe they need to see a specialist to help with candida or what are some steps they can take on their own? The f- smartest thing anybody could do is hearing my voice who has candida, who's been fighting this chronically is get a copy of my book, the candida chronicles, which is on Amazon. And that you can use that as a window to start understanding why you've been fighting this thing for so long and you can't get rid of it because candida is very tricky. There's a certain, there is a certain path that you have to take to get rid of it. Um, I've laid the path out over since I've been studying this since 1989, Candida, I've been a specialist. So I've laid out a path. Um, I'm sure mine is not the only one. I'm sure there are, there may be other valid therapies. I just happen to know that mine works in the most complete fashion because I base it on testing. Everything I do is based on testing. It's not based on my opinion or the person's symptoms. It's based on the test. Yeah, I can see you're very data driven, right? You have that that brain that works with with yeah. data and processing, right? You were, I mean, to be creating software programs in the 80s is pretty impressive, especially in the health field, you know. Um, I'm curious, what got you on this path? Like even going into natural medicine back in the 80s is pretty rare, honestly. <laughs> what got yeah, you on this path? Unfortunately, my father died of cancer mm. when I was a kid, when I was 18. Mm. And I and I used to ask the doctors that he was saying, like, what about vitamins? What about nutrition? What about the stuff I'm hearing about called right. Laetrile? There's this Laetrile, you know, isn't there anything you can do other than giving chemotherapy? Right. And they just looked at me blank. And then after he passed away, I studied, I started to study alternative medicine and healing. I started listening to Gary Null and all the uh, icons of the day called Fredericks. And um, that's what brought me to then want to study and become a practitioner. Wow. I, 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 I'm sorry for your loss. And I hear so many uh, stories of pain that have pushed us into, you know, my mom is actually on hospice right now and has type two diabetes and dementia and strokes. And it does um, definitely light a fire under you in, in the health field to help other people not have to go down that same path. You know, like I remember as I was starting to get educated, she was already type two, she got type two diabetes when I was a kid, you know, as I started to learn more, I was, you know, I'm talking about vitamin D and insulin sensitivity. She's like, Oh yeah, my vitamin D is always real low, but nobody told her anything about it, you know? So that's like, <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you this. Speaking of strokes and brain injuries, there is, there is a doctor who at one time held a patent, a U.S. patent on the cure for brain injuries. He was, um, he was a Nobel Prize candidate many years ago, and he still, he still practices. In fact, he's a very good friend of mine, and we often practice together. His name is Dr. William Hammersfar. Uh, he is, this man is an absolute genius. He, he, I've seen him reverse stroke victims in three to six months. I've seen people go into his office wow. in wheelchairs and walk out six months later. Wow. And so if anyone out there is um, in need of that kind of help, his name again is William Hammersfar. He's somebody you can look up on the internet. He, definitely he, was in, he was involved in Florida in the Terry Schiavo case. You may remember this many years ago. There was a woman named Terry Schiavo who had a stroke and the family wanted to pull the plug on her. And uh, Dr. Hammersfar was the one who said, no, she's still responsive. She should not be, you know, yeah. <laughs> And he appeared on, um, he was on the Fox News, he was on the Hannity, and back then it was Hannity and Combs show, talking mm-hmm. about this case and talking about what he saw. So um, he's definitely somebody who could be of help okay, to yeah. a lot of people. I will check him out. Thank you. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the cognitive effects. I mean, obviously, candida is your specialty, but I, if you're understanding candida, you have to understand the connection between the gut and mental health. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age where people still suffer from mental health issues and go to a doctor to get help and no one ever even talks to them. Most people I know like that come to me and they're on antidepressants or SNRIs or any of these, no one, ha- they have severe gut issues. I'm talking, haven't pooped in days or always have watery stools or like horrible, obvious acne, horrible, obvious gut issues. And no one even ever, they had no idea that their gut health is correlated to their mental health. So could you speak on gut health and mental health? The problem is that everyone's in the health field is a specialist. They send you to an eye doctor and he looks at you. They send you the first doctor who looks at your eye 
And then he sends you to the next one who can touch it. <laughs> that guy touches it, but then he can't do this next step. They have to send you to another guy who right. then is able to do something else. That's the problem is over specialization, not understanding True. more like from a holistic standpoint, how things right. connect and, and work. Right. And I'm fortunate enough to, even though I'm not a certified engineer, I grew up in my infancy as a um, practitioner surrounded by systems analysis engineers. All the fellows at, mm. at Grumman were all engineers. Right. So I got to think with the how does an engineer approach something right very cool so, but gut health as i was saying before about how the intestinal tract shuffles things back and forth when your gut health is compromised when your floor is compromised you can't shuffle back and forth hormones or neurotransmitters so there's going to be a problem in keeping them balanced in your bloodstream I would say probably, it wouldn't surprise me if like 90% of everybody who's on some kind of a, a psychiatric medication actually really needs to have their gut handled because that's what's really right. wrong. Right. And if you study SSRIs, most people don't understand how an SSRI works or what it means. I'll give you the Reader's Digest for just version just so you can see how insane this is. <laughs> when you take an SSRI, it's a, it's a blocker. What it does is an uptake block blocker of serotonin so what that means is that it's blocking your brain's ability to absorb serotonin from your bloodstream now you're saying now if someone's depressed and you hear that low serotonin cause depression why the hell would you want to give them a drug that's going to further block their ability of the serotonin to pass through the blood the blood brain barrier and get into your brain to hit those receptors well someone discovered that if you inhibit the ability of your brain to absorb serotonin, the receptor sites there become acutely heightened. So what serotonin you have now is, is utilized exponentially. Mm -hmm. And that's how the, but this is why this answers the question, why are all these side effects with these drugs in terms of making, when you watch TV and you hear the whole list of side effects, you hear depression, suicidal thoughts, Right. Well, it's, it's because then if you give it, when you give it to the wrong person that it's not going to work for correctly, now you've caused them to become de drastically deficient in serotonin to the point where their brain is now starving for it. And of course, they're suffering from serotonin deficiency. They're not getting that weird kickback of having those receptor sites become more acute. Now they're just plain deficient in it. You, you get your, it's safer to take a person and do a neurotransmitter test which are available. And what's amazing that psychiatrists that prescribe all these drugs never test anybody's neurotransmitters. They, they're guessing when they give people these drugs. It's just a guess. Yeah. But if you actually test someone's neurotransmitters and find what's low, there are companies out there. There's one in particular called Neuroscience Labs that's owned by a Dr. Uh, Kellerman. He has about 50 different supplements that are designed to balance all types of neurotransmitter Nice. patterns that you see right so if he sees your if your serotonin is low rather than starving your brain for more serotonin hoping that your receptor sites are going to become more active he gives you a product that has all the the um uh building blocks of serotonin yes. so that your body can make it itself and yeah. raise your level <laughs> yeah building blocks is a really important <laughs> phrase there that we just, we don't think about, right? Like, you know, hypothyroidism as an example is I would say at least half the people who come to me have hypothyroidism mm -hmm. and that no one ever told them what any of the building blocks for healthy thyroid function, they have no idea that magnesium, iodine, selenium, any of the, you know, these minerals play a role in it. They have no idea how breath and getting into the parasympathetic plays a role. They have no idea there's literally, there's only one answer. I'm not totally knocking. I, there's a time and a place for Western medicine. I'm not totally knocking it, but why are, you know, it's, it, I guess I'm preaching the choir here, but the, the lack of education on the building blocks that you need to help and support your body to operate optimally that that's not there. Like, it's crazy to me, yeah. like that, what you've created is like rogue health. <laughs> When it should be the, the basics, the, the, basics. the basics, I have to blame the drug companies because the drug yeah. companies, the drug companies go into the doctor's office and they say, you know, here's the latest illness. Here's the drug that handles it. All and right. the doctors get lazy. The doctors learn, have learned a lot of the things we're talking about, but they've long since forgotten it. They learned it in school. They wrote it down on a test 
And right. it was gone after that because they don't practice it. They don't put it in practice. They have the theory, but as far as having the actual mass behind it and the application, they don't have that because they were never taught it. Yeah, yeah. But when you talk about thyroid, you look at a hair analysis and you can, you can catch somebody because there, there's, there's two, two aspects of low thyroid. One is where the body itself has a hormone issue. The thyroid's not producing the hormone or the hormone is being blocked by cortisol, or it's being inhibited by insulin, or there's some other hormone like maybe estrogen, which is antagonizing the, th the hormone. So you can put all that, that's all in the box of blood work and looking at hormones and blood work. Mm -hmm. Then you have the second step, which is when the thyroid hormone enters this process, a lot of you guys learned in biology in school called the electron transport chain. It enters that chemical process in your cells to get into your Krebs cycle so that it ignites the ATP, which is uh, basically a fuel in your cells. Basically what it's doing is it's burning the glucose in your mitochondria. That's the second part. Now, how well the hormone gets into your cells is something more on the level of the cellular receptors for the hormones. And all those receptors happen to be minerals. So when you look at a hair test, you can get an instant, you can get an instant idea of how well this person's uh, hormone metabolism is working, not necessarily the thyroid gland and the production of the hormone, but how well that person's body is utilizing the hormone. Right. And this goes back to a book written by Dr. Broda Barnes, which was called Hypothyroidism, The Unsuspected Illness. Barnes talked about how you can tell more from someone's body temperature, how their thyroid's working than all the tests in the world. And this, this is true. If anyone has a body temperature that's below 97.8, they are functionally hypothyroid. I don't care what their blood test says. Their blood test may look fine, but then when you look at their, horn, their hair analysis, you're going to find they have really, really high copper levels or mercury, or they have a very high calcium to potassium ratio that's inhibiting this. In Guyton's physiology book, which is the Bible of physiology, many years ago, Guyton said, that in some way we, we don't properly understand yet, calcium acts as an inhibitor of thyroid hormone utilization in your cells and potassium acts as more like a synergist. It helps the thyroid hormone work. And then later on, we understood that the ratio he was seeing of calcium and potassium can be seen easily in a hair test. And then we saw the additional data of the zinc copper ratio that's involved in thyroid function. Yeah. The, the classic hypothyroid person is going to have high calcium to potassium, high copper to zinc. That's what you'll see in the hair test. And that doesn't mean his thyroid gland's malfunctioning. It means his body just doesn't use the hormone correctly. Mm. And if you rebalance those minerals, all of a sudden his body temperature comes up and all the symptoms of hypothyroidism start to go away. Wow. Thank you for that. Uh, can you speak on, okay, like this is, you know, I'm actively doing currently with my one-on-one -on -one clients, which we'll have to talk because I'm actually shifting more into a group thing. So it might be nice to refer people your way since I'm not going to be analyzing stuff one-on-one -on -one for very much longer in my business. But one thing that people, you know, <laughs> I try to tell people on social media, sometimes I'm like, you guys are like begging me to take advantage of you and sell you stuff. Like just because I'm, I'm like B vitamins might be a life-changing $20 supplement for one person and the next person, you don't even need it. Or I'm not going to just have you crap shoot, just start taking a bunch of zinc for no reason and right. mess up your ratios. And, but we live in the same age where I get it. People aren't educated. This isn't their field, but can you speak on just crap shooting supplements and minerals? Well, see, even, even with doctors, when I first got out of school, I had this medical doctor referred to me because he had a chronic prostate problem. So he, he comes to me and he must've been maybe the 11th patient that I had at the time. He comes to me and he starts telling me, well, you know, I heard about zinc being good for your prostate. And I had this chronic prostate problem for years. So three right. years ago, he says, I start taking zinc. I started taking 50 milligrams a day. Within six months, my prostate was cleared up. And he said, three weeks ago, the prostate problem came back. I didn't understand why. He says, I've been taking the zinc. And I said, is zinc the only supplement you're taking? He says, yes, I only take the zinc. <laughs> so he says that I doubled the zinc. And it got much worse. Yeah. 
So I said, okay, stop taking the zinc and start taking copper. Right. And I want you to get a hair analysis done. He gets the hair analysis. Sure enough, his copper is like microscopic. Yeah. Now, copper as a back, as a uh, mineral is responsible for your body's um, protection against bacterial infections. You get a low copper, you get virtually the same symptoms as vitamin C deficiency, but you're much more susceptible to a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. So he, lo he lowered his copper so much that he developed a bacterial infection in, in the weakest point that he had, which was right. his prostate. Wow. So this guy took the copper three days later, he calls me up, he says, gee, I don't know, you're crazy or I'm crazy, but it's getting better already. And so we just balanced the zinc to copper and then it was right. all the story was over. No more, no more problem. Yeah. That's a, that's a great example. Cause that's what it's like there. I, I, I think it's exciting that we can test. It's exciting that we can know, and yeah, you can also you can. save, you can save yourself a lot of money by testing. Yes. Like, that's pay what a little. people don't understand. Right, My wife a... says this all the time <laughs> when she overhears things with patients. So, you know, she talks about people have to understand the validity of testing and how it actually saves you money in the long run. Absolutely. <laughs> if, you, if, if you have someone with candida and they take B complex, they're going to go, you're, their candida is going to go through the roof. And wow. that's because what B complex does is B complex breaks down starches and sugars and in your intestinal tract into more assimilatable forms for your cells. <laughs> now it's doing that for you. What do you think it's doing for the candida? It's doing wow. the same thing for candida. You eat a piece of bread and take a B complex. If you have candida, you're going to be uh, in quite some shape. That is such a, that's such a great example too. Is that's, it's a, uh, people, just, I get this question a lot. What do you take? <laughs> Right. And I, I'm like, I, I always say, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> I don't want you to take what I take. I'm taking what I take because I tested and right. I know that I need this. Right. right. Yep. Um, can you speak on, you talked about parasites. I'm curious your experience on this. Cause I used to, in my early days, I was like, Oh, parasites, come on. And I have been amazed in my career. How many people actually have parasites? Can you speak on parasites a little bit? Is that more in your realm of it, it's, it's, expertise? um, still amazes me. Yeah, I've been I've been doing this for so many years, and you know, yeah. candida, candida, and parasites are so related. Every anyone who has parasites has candida. Anyone who has candida has parasites because the environment in the intestinal tract that supports either is the same, and they happen to be very synergistic and symbiotic mm -hmm. with each other. Wow. If you could, if you could be a tiny little action figure and take a walk with a flashlight through somebody's colon. You're going to see all this normal intestinal tract. You're going to see patches of good bacteria. Then you're going to come across this section that's going to smell weird. It's going to smell moldy and sweet. And you're going to see yeast growing there. And you're going to see parasites and bad bacteria all huddled, huddled together, co covered by biofilm, which is protecting them. Wow. Then you walk a little further. Everything is nice again. And you keep walking and there's another patch. And it's because they they grow in your intestinal tract in a spotty blotchy fashion it makes it hard to find them in stool tests very often stool tests for parasites or candida show negative because the organisms don't grow in a uniform manner the way bacteria does which is easy to pick up in the stool so that's tricked western doctors into thinking that we don't have it they think only people in third world countries have it right. well look who's driving your cab look who's in the kitchen and the restaurants look who's all around you people from third world countries so they've brought those organisms here. At one time when you went to school to study parasitology, you studied parasites that were native to your region. Now that's no longer valid because parasites are coming right. over here all day long on, on international flights. So you have to be able to recognize parasites from anywhere in the world. And unfortunately, that's something that's only very slowly catching up in the educational system. Yeah, I've heard from some specialists that they, when they suspect parasites, they're like, really, the only way we can find out is to go through a parasite cleanse and see if parasites come out. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's not totally true, because there are, I have a urine test, mm -hmm. which measures the amount of parasite material, let's say waste products okay. that shows in your urine. There are more advanced tests nowadays. There are DNA stool tests that can be done. Mm -hmm. And they look for the DNA of these parasites in your stool. Now they're they're not a hundred percent, but they're better than what we used to have. There there have been um, a few doctors in, in in New York City who I've known 
who developed the method. It's called the method is called the Parish Bueno method after the two doctors that originated it. And you go into the doctor's office, they take a rectal swab of your mucus in the rectum, and they look at it right then and there under the microscope to see if they can see any type of larva or any activity of parasites. That's a valid test. Unfortunately, there are very few people who do it. Yeah. But when you take a, a stool sample and you send it to a lab and it's in that little bottle with the formaldehyde that's preserving it, you have to remember that stool still has a lot of your own digestive enzymes in it. So by the time that stool sample makes it to the lab, those enzymes have digested and destroyed half of what you, you might find that's pathogenic in there. Mm. So what are you looking for in the urine test for parasites? We look for albumin bound antigens and antibody complexes, which are reacting to the parasites. Mm. We have a reagent that makes them go solid in the urine. Okay. And so I assume that someone will need to go to a naturopath typically for something like that. Actually, I'm the only one who has it. Really? <laughs> yeah, I developed it about 20. We developed it about 20 years ago. Very cool. And we're the only one who, have, who actually have that test. But, you know, there is the, there is, it is valid what you were saying before about a doctor thinks the only way to figure this out is to put the person on the treatment and then see how they do. It used to be that way with candida years ago, because when there were no candida tests and it was a brand new thing, everybody was reading Dr. Trust's book and we're like, wow, this candida. Mm -hmm. Doctors would give or nutritionists would give people antifungals and see how they felt. Mm -hmm. If they felt really bad from them, or really better, we knew you had candida. If it was either one, if you felt like nothing, we knew it probably wasn't the case. Mm. And that is true to a degree with parasites, but with parasites, you also have to look more into the history of the person. Have they eaten a lot of undercooked animal protein? Um, do they tend to eat things you know, raw a lot? Because unfortunately, even vegetables that are organic, you know, what's organic fertilizer, right? Yeah. Organic fertilizer is feces. So if right. they eat a lot of organic things raw, right. once again, if they get rectal itching, which is a huge sign, if they mm. if they tend to um, like clutch their teeth at night, mm. bruxism where they're grinding their teeth at night is a major sign of, of having parasites. If they have strange symptoms in the middle of the night, wake up with weird things going on, have insomnia, have bad dreams. If they, if they have a collection of these symptoms, you're looking at someone who, I know, then of course the digestive issues, bloating, belching yeah then wow. you're looking at somebody most likely who has parasites wow okay thank you for that you gotta um, look at the profile of the person and then just try to combine it with whatever lab tests you have available right right do you still actively work with clients or how does somebody partake of oh yeah you're... yeah yeah we you do um okay absolutely yeah, patients, I guess. go go to the go to the go on the internet and um go to www.health-truth.com or my other two websites are the New York City Candida Doctor and the New York City Thyroid Doctor. Okay, awesome, awesome. And we'll make sure we link up your book as well. Um, real quick, I don't know, it keeps popping up in my mind. We talk yeah. about the organic acid test because I know people probably outside of health don't know what that is. That's part of what you guys can run through your system. Can you explain mm -hmm. what organic acids test is? Sure. Well, first of all, organic acids are like waste products that come from your metabolism and from the metabolism of different creatures, bacteria, yeasts, and your own body. And there are different organic acids that are released through different chemical processes. So you can check how well those chemical processes are running in your body by looking at the level of the organic acid that relates to it. In addition, the um, better organic acid tests have a dysbiosis panel. So they will look for the organic acids that are produced uniquely by candida and yeasts and molds and certain bacteria and even friendly bacteria. So, and it is, um, a reliable test for candida, yeah. looking at it, the, um, the levels of arabinose in particular in an organic acid test is a pretty reliable test for candida overgrowth. Yeah, very well respected, I'd say, amongst health mm -hmm. professionals. And then hair mineral analysis. Are you testing hair and blood because you're getting the longer snapshot from the hair? Or you know, mm -hmm. can you explain why you're testing both of those? Well, we do both of those because hair, blood, unfortunately, doesn't tell you accurately the mineral status. Yeah. So you have to remember blood is a, is a mode of transportation. Yeah. Hair is a mode of storage. Yeah. So when your hair, you're seeing what's storing in your tissues and the blood, mm -hmm. you're seeing what's being transported. Blood and hair are never going to agree and they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. 
This yeah. is where a lot of medical doctors go off the deep end with this. They said, well, I checked his potassium and his hair and the blood and they didn't, they were, they weren't the same. I said, well, that's supposed to be the same. <laughs> They're not supposed to be. One is, yeah. is storage over a long period of time. The other is right. influenced by what the fellow ate, his exercise, sweating, et cetera. Right. So they're not going to match. Right. A great, great, probably the best book you could ever buy on hair analysis is called Trace Minerals, written by my good friend, Dr. David L. Watts, PhD, who's the owner of TEI Labs, that, in my opinion, by far the best lab to do a hair analysis with. Okay. And his, his book, Trace, Trace Elements, gives you a breakdown on all the minerals and all the patterns that we see that relate to your endocrine system. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little mineral obsessed. And it's, I think it's important to be aware of this right now with our soil quality being more depleted, our stress levels are higher, we're not living in nature and, you know, being exposed to sunlight and this natural environment, we're like in these little boxes, high stress with depleted soils, like it's something to be aware of. <laughs> there was there was a doctor named Albright, who was in the Department of Agriculture in the state and the University of Iowa. And back in the 30s, he went through in a cornfield and just started to pick corn. He brought it back to the university and they analyzed it for trace minerals. And then 25 years later, he went back to the same field, picked corn, went back, analyzed it. And he found that the trace mineral content of that corn had dropped by about 25, 30 percent. Yeah. 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 If you, if you just Google mineral content in, in food today versus like 1970, it's insane. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's scary, you know? So yeah, I'm a huge fan of supplementing minerals. And even like my kids and I have noticed that like, I used to not like the way water tasted until I started remineralizing my water yeah, and I'm sure. like, like can't stop drinking it. It's right. fascinating. Right. My body's like, yes. <laughs> but it's, it's the minerals in the water that hold the hydration. One of something I learned totally accidentally many years ago was because I was, a, I would, had been a marathon runner for years and I learned about yeah. hydration the hard way. <laughs> so what we learned was that you, why you needed to take electrolyte drinks was because when you were running, you were sweating and you were losing minerals. And when you were drinking plain water, you weren't getting the electrolytes you were losing through your sweat. Right. And you can actually reach a point with this where you start to pee clear and you start, the more water you drink, the thirstier you are. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a matter of not having the electrolytes to hold the hydration. Yeah. Yeah. I specialize in keto and that's a major risk factor with keto. If you don't understand that you're in that diuretic state and you're losing yeah. these key yeah. minerals, people are like, Oh, I just feel lightheaded and foggy. Cause I'm keto. I'm like, no, you're dehydrated and it's not water. And, and a lot of people do that. They just start drinking more and more and more water. And they're actually depleting themselves of minerals more. even more. Yeah. And I, yeah, I it's actually very rare that I've, I've ever made anybody who understands this. So it's, oh, it's, yeah, nice, it's, it's nice to have this talk. <laughs> it's Most crucial. People to look at me like I'm crazy. No, it's crucial to know with keto. And I even like bodybuilders and stuff. I tell them when I see them drinking that big gallon of water, I'm like, are you thirsty all the time? Even though you're drinking tons of water? Yeah. You're, you're actually making yourself more mineral depleted. So you right. need to start throwing some electrolytes into that. And yep. yeah, I, I, I experienced this firsthand because I ran the Boston marathon in ketosis. Oof. And when I went, so you're, I'm in this, they call it diuresis of fasting for people listening. So like you're, you can become dehydrated a lot more easy when you're in that keto say it was a hot year for Boston and little miss unprepared here did not check. I did not know that you could not bring a camel pack with you. So I had ketones that are ketone. They're bound to salts, right? The beta hydroxybutyrate is bound to salts, mm -hmm. high salt content. I had a bunch of electrolytes. I had salt packs and all these things mm -hmm. ready. And they, I, I go get on the bus and the guy goes, the security guards, like you can't bring that. And I'm like, Oh no, I need this. <laughs> like I need this. And he's like, no, you can't bring it. And I'm like, Oh no. So here I am deep in ketosis and I'm just having to rely on like, you know, Gatorade or Powerade or whatever they had, which what barely they gave has. You. So, so you couldn't bring your own. You had I couldn't bring it. Your... So I got so oh. dehydrated. I was blacking out. I thought I was going to end up in the emergency room. I somehow miraculously finished that thing, but I've experienced what that feels. I sure I was drinking a lot, but I knew what was happening inside my body. I was begging at all the first aid tents. I'm like, does anybody have any salt pills? Do you have salt? I just need some salt. Yeah. And all these people were so nice on the court handing out oranges and I'm like, I need a banana and salt. <laughs> I need, I need minerals. <laughs> now for a, for a middle way on that, there's a book people can buy that's called slow burn. That's written by Stu Middleman. Stu Middleman, you for many years was the um, American champion for the ultra marathon. He did the 50, the hundred mile, and even the 24 hour marathons. 
Wow. And he, he developed um, a technique of training more at a slower pace yeah, and not relying on carbohydrates. Yes. Yeah. There, there's a, a what's his name? Uh, oh my gosh. His name's slipping me right now, but um, oh my gosh, I heard him speak at a conference. I can't believe I forget his name right now, but he ran hundred miler in a ketogenic state. And it does. I have actually trained ultra marathoners on keto and they do really well. As long as you're not in that glycolytic right, right. pedal to the metal type. Because you're, not, <laughs> you're not relying on glycogen at that point. Right. Your body's really <laughs> trained to burn fat. So you can, yes. Run it's indefinitely. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to go low speed at ketos, they, the, the ultra endurance athletes love, love keto for that reason, but you just yeah. can't be going pedal to the metal. <laughs> no, not for very long. Right. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. I will make sure I link that up in the show notes. Um, tr- health truth, sorry, your website, health truth, health dash truth.com guys. And I'll link your book as well on Amazon. So people can learn about candida, please guys. If you even suspect that you or somebody, you know, has candida it's so common. Thank you for the stat 30%. I, almost, 30, yeah. I almost thought it was higher than that. It's, it's common and you're right. It's sneaky. Like people think, Oh, I'm just gaining weight or I'm just, you know, I, I, just, I don't know what's wrong with me. I have mental health issues. And you start to see these ticks for candida real quick, sugar cravings. Do you feel like that's a candida sign? Yeah, yeah very often it is. And you, yeah. as, you, as you know, it could be chromium, vanadium imbalance, but yeah. um, very often it is, it is candida yeah. or parasites. Wow. And it was something you said earlier that I just wanted to touch on again. You, you talked about how you, uh, people with mental health or depression issues, they were constipated. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people who moved their bowels like a few times a week when I got their bowels moving several times a day, the first thing they tell me is, gee, I feel so much brighter. Yes. I'm less depressed. They yes. don't say, gee, you know, my stomach feels better. The first thing they tell me is how emotionally they feel better. Yes. Thank you for highlighting that. I, um, I'm really kind of big on gut motility right now. Cause I had a personal experience. This is like kind of TMI and whatever <laughs> it is what it is. I have really good gut health, really good gut motility. And so I guess I've taken that for granted. I haven't, I'm grateful for it, but I, I, I was on a hike and I actually broke my tailbone. I went in my chiropractor. He's like, yeah, you chipped the tip of it and it hurt so bad. And just, sorry guys, so much TMI, but I like, wasn't pooping as regularly because I was literally scared to poop because it hurt so right. bad. Right, so my right. body was like, no. And so I experienced what it feels like to not be. And I was sorry for the pun, but like, I felt like crap. Like I could tell, I was like, I think I'm like reabsorbing toxins or something. Like just my, my brain fog, my energy levels. I was like, this is important. Gut motility is really important on how you feel day to day. And if you look at animals, I like to look at animals as teachers. What does a dog do after they poop? They start running around like crazy. They get all excited. They're like energetic, (laughs) truly, you know? And so it's, yeah. Thank you for highlighting that gut motility is, has such an impact on how you feel mentally. You know, there was a group of doctors from um, the United Kingdom many years ago who went to Africa to study the primitive people there because they had heard a rumor that the primitive people in Africa never had any case of colon cancer. Mm. So they went to study these people. Well, they were shocked because not only did they find out they never had colon cancer, they never had any cancer. They never had diabetes. They didn't have arthritis. They didn't have any of the chronic degenerative diseases that we have in the West. And when they studied these people, they found that the amount of fiber they ate per day was somewhere around 24 grams of crude fiber. They had four to five bowel movements a day, which had no odor. And when they analyzed the stool, they had the perfect balance of friendly bacteria. Now, compare that to people in the United Kingdom and America who average maybe four grams of crude fiber in the world uh, 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 per day, and we lead the world in colon cancer and other diseases. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I'm so big on fiber. It's one of my main messages in nutrition, you know, and obviously there's some, if you have, you know, um, some sort of imbalance or something like that, sometimes those fibers, you need to minimize them a little bit, certain ones that are irritating you. But in general, like fiber, not to mention the short chain fatty acids, the butyrate that feeds your mental health, as mm-hmm. well as that regularity that you get. Like it's, it's just this symphony of all these wonderful things. So fiber is like one of the most, and plus, if you want to be lean, if you eat fiber, it slows down that digestive process and it keeps you more insulin sensitive, keeps you right. full on very nutrient dense foods. So I think it's just like such a smart, easy way to stay healthy 
both mentally and in your body composition and all of it. So yeah. And for those people who react badly to fiber, there are a, f- a few of them. There is a state of fiber intolerance, which is largely due to digestive deficiencies and having a bad imbalanced flora. Mm-hmm. Because as you know, your friendly bacteria feeds off the fiber to produce the, sh- the short chain fatty acids and whatnot. Right. So, but once that cycle gets broken down, it needs to be jump started. It's just, if you just eat the fiber, some people are just not going to respond. They may respond badly, but it can be fixed. That's the yeah. good news. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that kind of wraps us back around full circle to testing. Sometimes people don't want to test because they're afraid that they're going to test and not know what to do. And I'm like, no, we have solutions. Like, don't be afraid to test. There are solutions and you can feel so much better and you can save yourself so much money, not just guessing. And like, if you don't feel, sometimes people don't know, they don't feel optimal because they're used to it, but like, try one thing, like invest in like one test, one, one test with, I would say not with the Western medicine doctor. Sorry. That's just my my personal recommendation, go the naturopathic route, let them make some recommendations and see how you feel. And when you start feeling better, you're like, Oh my gosh. I mean, that's why I'm a health coach. Cause I had a transformation and I was like, I feel like I live in an alternate reality now than what I used to, because I feel so much better, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of testing. I'm a huge fan of figuring out what's actually going on with you and giving your body the building blocks that it needs to just thrive. Like if we just get out of the way and we feed our little subjects, I look at my body as like a kingdom of little right. subjects and I'm the queen and I'm a good queen that says, here you go. Here's all the things you need to thrive. <laughs> then they will, you know? So well, if someone had a choice of a test, I would say that bang for the buck, a hair analysis that's properly interpreted or the organic acid test. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably going to give you the most for your money. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I agree. I've got a I've got a friend that he's big on the hair mineral analysis as he's been on the show many times. So my audience is probably familiar. So um yeah, we I I can't say enough, especially when there's a hormone imbalances, hormone imbalances, hypothyroidism, stuff like that. I'm like, just get the hair mineral test first. <laughs> yeah. Go that route. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I can tell you're a fountain of knowledge. We could go for like four hours and you could probably hit on a million different areas. So, um, so respect what you've brought to the health industry. Thank you for, um, taking the, I guess the putting the heart into it to write books and create software systems. Like it takes a lot of effort and energy. So thank you for doing that and for coming and sharing with us today. My pleasure. Absolutely.